of Senator Menendez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for a very distinguished panel uh, to provide your insights. I think this hearing comes at a, a precipitous time for both economic partnerships and partnerships with the United States in general. And the President <clears throat> remains obsessed with a campaign slogan that implies the United States is happy to go it alone, questioning longstanding treaties and positions of international leadership. So ultimately, I fear that puts the United States at a strong disadvantage when it comes to building productive partnerships that benefit all Americans. It does not seem in the interest of the United States, for example, for our leader to routinely denigrate entire countries and their citizens. Countries like Mexico, for example, which the United States has a nearly $600 billion per year trading relationship and on which about 5 million American jobs depend. So with that concern as a framework, let me ask a couple of questions. Uh, Secretary Sierra, uh, as you know, the President has been adamant that Mexico would need to pay for a new border wall between the United States and Mexico, and his latest estimates to Congress are around $25 billion. Earlier this month, in fact, the President said he would use NAFTA negotiations to get Mexico to pay for his wall. As a former Mexican Ministry of Commerce and Industry, do you believe that the Mexican government will renegotiate NAFTA in a way that would pay for the wall? <laughs> I'm very happy that the Mexican ambassador is here so that he can respond to that question because I'm not a specialist <laughs> on the issue. But no, I'm not sure I could be very precise in my answer. But what I can tell you, Senator, is that well, if you were back in your role as the Secretary of Commerce, do you envision yourself on behalf of your country negotiating NAFTA in a way that would pay for the wall? No. no. But, but I, can, I can add one thing. May, may I in one second? Surely. Uh, when you hear these numbers of the trade flows between our, among our three countries, it's obvious that the connectivity of the region has increased dramatically. Mexico used to export $100 million a day. Today, Mexico exports a $1 billion a day. So if you want to stop that driven market force with a wall, you will not be able to stop it. And it actually will create some social cost because people benefit from all this trade. So I think the, the approach should be different. I understand that we have to have an intelligent border, an efficient border, but not a protectionist border. Mm -hmm. uh, ambassador Wayne, let me ask you, in your years of diplomatic service and as a former ambassador to Mexico, does this threat make any sense to you in terms of diplomatic relations or negotiation posture? Um, what I can say is that the favorable views of the United States have dropped from over 60 percent to 30 percent in Mexico. And uh, it's, I'm sure, because of the strain of critical remarks uh, being made by the United States. And that's just not a good state of affairs. We worked from NAFTA forward to really change the relationship with Mexico, to build trust and to build cooperation. And this has been quite successful. And you can track mm -hmm. that growing cooperation and gr growing trust. And in the last 10 years, uh, in the security and border security and working against organized crime in those areas, there's been tremendous progress between the two countries in building that trust and a trust that's needed because both countries need to work against and these, let, let these threats. Let me to that question of trust because in a recent Gallup poll from 2016 to 2017, Canadians' approval of U.S. leadership went from 60 percent to 20 percent. Mexican approval of the U.S. fell to 16 percent, the lowest it has been in a quarter century. So our policy is obviously not driven by international polls, obviously not. But I think it affects our soft power abilities to enter into agreements and negotiations with countries that have such a low view of the United States because it makes it more difficult for the leaders of those countries at this time to engage in some of the review that we want to see of NAFTA on intellectual property rights, which certainly need to be brought up to date, on a more vigorous enforcement, some of us would believe, uh, on labor and environment. But, but the essence of the agreement, uh, when you try to change it, you have part of it as public support within your countries. Uh, I think the Prime Minister spoke about that, even facing when there wasn't necessarily 
uh, maybe uh, support, and then building that support and seeing the results. So I get concerned that our ability to negotiate, whether it be here uh, in this all-important question of NAFTA or beyond, is affected by how we are viewed in the world in terms of a populist that's going to have to have be supporting their leaders to engage the United States in a way that is in the national interest of the United States as well as their own national interests. And I appreciate your insights in that regard. Senator, um, let me step back just for a second and give you a little anecdote that occurred in the Oval Office with President George Herbert Walker Bush. NAFTA was in the process of concluding its negotiations, but we weren't there yet. And I'm alone with the President, who in my judgment uh, had a remarkable knowledge of international affairs and a nuanced understanding of the world and where it all came down. And President Bush said to me, you know, Brian, if this thing works out, the way the Canada-United States free trade agreement has gone so far. 25 years from now, the ideal result might be the following. There will be prosperity, in, added prosperity in Canada, in the United States, and in Mexico. But in Mexico, if in the northern tier of Mexico, NAFTA generates such employment opportunities and new wealth for Mexico, as a developing country, that's what we want for it. If that happens, perhaps we'll see the day when more young Mexicans return to Mexico than come to the United States. And I believe, I may be wrong on the numbers, I think that happened last year. Now, there's an entirely different way. I mean, you're, you're dealing with two problems with one, at once. The prosperity of a great trading country like Mexico, the immigration challenge in the United States, and all done in, in a highly civilized and productive uh, manner. I was talking to a, a very, well, the uh, very prominent business guy the other day in America. He said, one of our major problems is we don't have enough immigrants. We're going to have to do something about, about our immigration policy. And I know that in Canada, we have a problem too. Our problem in Canada is we don't have enough immigrants. We need more, and I've always contended that. And I believe that you don't have a growing dynamic economy without the creative abilities and devotion and loyalty that immigrants bring to their country. Thank you for that insight. Thank, Thank you. you. Senator Young.